they will not help. Thanks, Finn. Um, and look, thanks for the uh, the invitation. Um, so that I'll. I'll, I'll um, share my screen um, and share some slides. Actually, I would, but uh, apparently I can't. Perhaps someone could make me a host or something so I can. Um, Paddy, could you do the honours, please? Thanks. Um, yeah, that's what we're working on. Cool. Uh, there we go. Um, okay, so uh, look, what I'll do is, um, is kind of run through some... Uh, some of the main arguments um, around starting with what tax havens are and why in some ways we should actually be quite cautious about using that term, but getting into something of the global picture of firstly, where in terms of national inequalities, um, the role of tax is and why it's been so constrained compared to what it could be over recent decades, especially in, but not only in lower income countries. And I'll talk about the kind of um, policy platforms uh, and tools that are available and the way that we could uh, approach something like a, a state of um, tax justice uh, globally and nationally. Um, and finally, I'll look at the, the opportunities kind of where, where things stand and things are moving very quickly um, at the moment. As, as Finn mentions, the Biden um, uh, administration is pushing very hard on some key areas of this. In fact, though, there's been a lot of movement in the last 18 months um, before the administration came in. Um, and in some ways, if they could get aligned with that global process that's been going on already, we'd see some real, um, some really quite dramatic uh, progress. And whether that can happen um, is something we'll be finding out over the next six months or so. So I'll finish up kind of looking at where we might go. But, um, the reason I slightly tweak my title to just tax, um, which you can read uh, whichever way you want, is because of this concern about how sometimes we use or think about the term tax havens. So let me just get into a few uh, kind of basic um, points. And I should say, I'll, I'll talk for something like 40 minutes, um, give or take, um, and then very much look forward to getting into some, some questions. Okay. Um, so as a starting point, uh, we lose an enormous amount of money. Um, 427 billion is our very conservative estimate from the State of Tax Justice uh, 2020, which is an annual report we do, which shows broadly for each country or jurisdiction, the amount of tax loss that they suffer from corporate tax uh, abuse and from individual tax abuse, but also the amount of tax losses that they inflict on others because every jurisdiction, more or less, has the potential to act as a tax haven in relation to others by providing secrecy, by allowing um, less uh, tax, sometimes zero tax, to be paid. This $427 billion number is made up of $245 billion um, of losses to corporate tax abuse by the largest multinationals. And that's a particularly conservative estimate. The IMF, the International Monetary Fund, for example, estimates about 600 billion is lost uh, in that dimension each year. So we're deliberately erring on the conservative side. And then about $182 billion, we estimate, is lost to um, the tax losses on undeclared offshore assets and income streams of individuals, basically, um, uh, stashing your money uh, offshore. And of course, everywhere is offshore to everywhere else. It simply means uh, over there outside this jurisdiction. Um, and yet we tend to conflate it with the idea of tax havenry, which uh, I will get to shortly why that is um, unfortunate. Those tax losses though, and if you take nothing else from this, take this, the numbers are big and the tax losses drive national and international inequalities. They drive national inequalities for a number of reasons, but particularly these. First, because it's difficult to tax the mobile profits of multinational companies, and it's difficult to tax the offshore holdings, the wealth and um, income streams of individuals, and both of those are overwhelmingly the assets and income streams of the most wealthy. 
it is difficult by definition to do the kind of progressive taxation to curb inequalities at the top. Now, secondly, because those things are difficult, um, we then see, and the power is where it is, right? The people who have uh, assets and income streams tend also to have political power. We end up with tax systems that, that aren't even trying to be progressive, even though it's difficult. They're just not being very progressive full stop. So firstly, it's hard. And then secondly, we end up not actually trying to be um, to curtail inequalities as much as we might do. And that affects individual inequalities, inequalities between households and so on, but also group inequalities. We end up with much greater gender inequality, racial inequality, inequality between ethno-linguistic groups than we might do because of the way that our tax systems fail systematically. And I'll, I'll get into to that a bit more. But those tax losses also drive international inequalities because the way that they play out is systematically biased. It isn't that there are some random distribution of tax losses from these problems. They fall most heavily on lower income countries that have neither the political power to demand better treatment from other jurisdictions, nor um, the economic might um, to enforce their will uh, domestically in the way that richer countries, to some extent at least, can do. And so when you look at the global distribution of tax losses, the bigger amounts of money are being lost by bigger economies, but the higher share of tax revenues, the higher share of public spending on things like health, so important um, and so, so crucially seen in this pandemic, are lost by lower income countries. So the losses may be smaller in dollar terms, but they are more intense in terms of what is literally going uh, unpaid uh, for in terms of public services. So that gives you this pattern where the inequalities within and between countries are worsened by these tax losses. Um, and I would say that until at best about 15 years ago, tax issues have been very largely neglected in discussions of what we might call international development, if that's still a term that people use, um, and certainly within international economics. If you look at the corporate tax literature, there's an enormous amount looking at whether or not tax systems have marginally um, bad impacts on corporate investment and relatively little, especially up till about even 10 years ago, looking at the size of the losses that are imposed by companies and individuals managing uh, not to meet their tax responsibilities. So these losses really matter for the inequalities that um, that we, we do or should care about. Okay, but the third piece and why I suggest the title of just tax rather than um, tax haven or hell is this. The term tax haven and a lot of the policy responses that have been associated with it over particularly the last couple of decades are loaded with racism both in terms of how the term is understood, how it is used, how we image it, and um, then how we respond to it in policy terms. And so although it's a term we use, we try very carefully to turn it around when we do use it, rather than play into what is often a, a media reflection of that term that really does um, uh, emphasize the worst, uh, the worst points of how it's been used. So let me give you an example of what I mean. If you search for um, tax haven um, and find news stories or images, the news stories that you'll find will have images like this. Tax haven conjures up still this idea of a sunny island with palm trees where really you know, somewhere way away over there where rich people are, yes, hiding their money under the beach, right? Um, people living it up uh, at your expense. Now, don't get me wrong, there is a lot in that, um, but it is not the only pattern that we see here. And when we overemphasize that, what we risk playing into, and I should say Steve Dean and Atia Warris have a really excellent paper out just, just um, the other week on 10 myths of tax havens, um, which I, I thoroughly recommend to everyone, that makes a lot of these a lot of these points and, and others. There is a dynamic that says 
those small islands over there, typically small islands led by people whose skin is black or brown, are responsible for the losses suffered by us in the respectable rich countries, typically led by people whose skin is white. Now that bit isn't always said aloud, but that is very much the dynamic that underpins this. And so every time you see a media story with a palm tree illustrating a tax haven, it is echoing um, and that imagery is kind of re-embedding that logic. And it matters because you know, it matters how we all think about things, but also because of the policy programs that follow. So famously in, in around 2000, the OECD, the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, pursued um, uh, an effort to shut down tax havens, um, as in the language that was often used, which picked out, not on any objectively verifiable criteria, but purely on the basis of the analysis of the OECD, the group of rich countries, a set of very small jurisdictions and said, it's you, you need to clean up your act. Even though what they were asking of those jurisdictions, very often led by people with brown or black skin, was a set of things which pretty much the OECD countries themselves, and especially the bigger havens, if you like, including the United States, and the United Kingdom were simply not delivering on themselves. And that led to a pushback, including by um, <clears throat> the Congressional Black Caucus uh, in the, um, the US Congress, which really ended up um, shutting down the OECD process. And at the time, <clears throat> some tax justice campaigners were um, disappointed by that, but the underlying politics of it was so wrong that actually where we've come back to now, the kind of work we do with the Financial Secrecy Index and the Corporate Tax Haven Index gives you, based on objectively verifiable criteria, a much more rigorous way into looking at these jurisdictions. And sure, <clears throat> you do find small islands um, within within the group of jurisdictions of most concern, Bermuda and the British Virgin Islands and the Cayman are very often um, in the mix, but you also find major uh, economies and OECD countries, countries from the European Union, which has its own blacklist, which also continues to identify very small jurisdictions, doesn't even consider European Union member states, they tweak their rules in order, they distort them in order not to include the United States. But you know, the Netherlands, Switzerland, Luxembourg, Ireland, and a set of small European uh, Union member states would all feature in any corporate tax haven measure, certainly near the top of our corporate tax haven index. The United States is, along with Switzerland, um, they make up two of the three biggest financial secrecy jurisdictions. So there's no question that when you take objectively verifiable criteria, you find there are still some small islands involved, but there's a lot of major white economies in there too. And if we are careless with the term tax haven, we risk pushing an image that it is only one sort of jurisdiction that is uh, that is in there. So if we care about tax justice and just tax, it is important to start with that kind of uh, framing. One last example of this, and then I will absolutely get into something that looks like what I'm um, more formally supposed to be talking about. A lot of the international discourse in this area, um, particularly in the international development space, has been around the idea of stopping corruption. Um, and underpinning that very often has been Transparency International's Corruption Perceptions Index. Now, Transparency International do an awful lot of good work and they have really got on the agenda of some key financial transparency measures. We often work with them. But the Corruption Perceptions Index is a shameful piece of work and should have been shut down and got rid of years ago. Um, it is built on a set of measures of the perceptions um, of largely an international business uh, focused elite. And those perceptions tell you one thing above all. Year after year, the strongest single measure correlated with position on the Corruption Perceptions Index is per capita GDP. Poverty is perceived of as corrupt and as the locus of corruption. And that's why this map looks like it does. All these dark reds that you see, especially across Sub-Saharan Africa, are 
where poverty, where corruption rather is perceived to be, and these are by and large the countries with the lowest um, per capita um, incomes. If we take the financial secrecy index, which is our broad based measure of the sorts of financial secrecy that jurisdictions use to promote illicit financial flows, tax abuses and corruption that takes place elsewhere in order for them to take a little piece of it. The financial secrecy index tells a very different story about where corruption is. Look at the dark reds. They are not across the countries with the lowest per capita income. Indeed, they are across many of the countries and some of the very small jurisdictions that you can't quite see in the Atlantic too, with the highest per capita incomes in the world. These are the drivers of global corruption. And so we should be careful about perceptions of corruption that align with poverty. And very often because of the history of empire, which still to a large degree determines where poverty is in the world, often align with race and the color of people's skin too. For all of these reasons, there are kind of systematic inequalities built into the discourse, even before we kind of get into um, the tax justice analysis. And we just, we need to kind of be very careful about how we're thinking about all of this stuff in order to make sure that when we go off and do our terribly neutral economic analysis and run some regressions with the corruption perceptions index, we're not inadvertently locking in um, structural racism to the approaches that we're that we're taking. Okay, ramble over. Here is a proper presentation. Um, uh, so I will run through um, slightly more quickly than I was going to because that's taken longer than I meant to. Um, something like this. I'll talk about the four R's of tax and these are really the four reasons why um, why we care about tax, why tax matters, what tax delivers um, for economies and societies and I'll contrast that with the tax consensus which is broadly the, the tax elements of the Washington consensus and the kind of tax policy positions that have led the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank uh, and many other international organizations in their approaches uh, for, for the last few decades. Then I'll talk a little bit, um, as I've already, about the state of tax justice, where the world is today. So moving from the national to the international and then end with that discussion of policy uh, opportunities. Um, uh, and things really are moving quickly at the minute. So there's kind of a, a, a lot of opportunity now things that used to be in the absolute wilderness that were only ever uttered by those those wild-eyed people at the Tax Justice Network are now the global policy agenda. And the fight is to see whether we can deliver them in such a way that includes countries at all uh, income levels, not only OECD members. So that's that's kind of where the, where the battle is. Okay, the four hours of tax uh, and the tax consensus. Um, the first of the four hours of tax, the first two really are the ones that we think of, I think, most easily. Certainly revenues, people always think of, um, and it makes sense. This is where the money comes from. Even if you're kind of really into MMT, ultimately at some point we are kind of talking about uh, generating money um, uh, from tax revenues, uh, not just uh, printing it off. Um, and those revenues determine at some level, um, our ability to and willingness to spend on public services. And that in turn has an impact on whether those public services are of high quality and whether they are universal, whether they're fully inclusive of people. There's a very uh, nice paper, um, he said immodestly, that um, Paddy Carter and I wrote together on tax and health. And although causality is very difficult to attribute, um, the pattern of relationships is very clear. So what you see is when for a given level of government revenues, a government that is more dependent on tax as opposed to aid or natural resource wealth, for example, will typically spend more on public health. But not only that, the public health system for a given level of spending will be more inclusive. It will have fewer people left out of it and the health outcomes will be better. Tax revenues matter and they matter for more than just the money. And I'll come back to some of the reasons why. But, you know, first of all, it's the money. $427 billion of, of global tax losses a year would do us very nicely to fund a lot of public services. Um, redistribution is the other that's kind of easy to think about. You know, tax systems are a fundamental part of 
how we raise the money that we then spend progressively, but also how we raise the money progressively or not. Do we have progressive direct taxes on incomes, on profits, on capital gains, on property, for example? Or do we rely on largely regressive taxes on consumption, for example, on uh, value added taxes? Um, these are decisions, and if we don't have tax systems that work well, we typically end up with lower revenues, but also lower redistribution and higher um, inequalities. To give you a sense of that, here is um, some data. This is from a report I did with Save the Children um, maybe 10 years ago now, um, but using Brazilian data from the mid 2000s. This data is quite extreme, but it's actually a pattern that you see in country after country at all sorts of income levels. So looking at direct taxes, um, this is in groups of households by um, their, uh, their incomes. So at the left hand side here, you have households that with a total income of less than twice the national minimum wage rising across the graph to the top end where it's households with, a with an income of more than 30 times the national minimum wage. Okay, so with direct taxes, um, taxes on incomes and, and profits and capital gains and so on, what we see is this very nice progressive schedule. Okay, country uh, households with the lowest uh, incomes are paying a much smaller proportion of their gross income in tax. That's what's on the, the left hand axis. So only a few percent of their income is going on these direct taxes, rising towards 10% of income for the richest households. Fantastic, a victory for progressive taxation. Okay, here's indirect taxes. Um, and notice that the axis has changed because this is important. We haven't just flipped to a completely regressive picture. This is also much, much bigger shares of uh, households incomes now going on regressive taxes, especially for the households with the lowest incomes, almost half of their incomes now going in indirect taxes. So when we add this together, it's the indirect regressive taxes that dominate. So the overall picture, although we have this nice little bit of progressive direct taxation, it is a drop in the bucket compared to this overall picture, which is regressive. Now, depending on the country you're in and depending on the period, and in this period it wasn't the case, but immediately afterwards it increasingly was, um, you may have significant progressive public spending that offsets some of this but it probably won't offset all of it. And in effect, you'll have people in the lowest income households contributing disproportionately more of their income towards what may or may not be very progressive public spending. It does not come out in the wash uh, in very many cases. Um, I'm gonna come back to this graph, but let me um, throw in a plug here uh, for the uncounted. One of the problems we have is that um, not everyone gets included in the data. So even where we're doing progressive taxation, there's two things, and progressive spending, there's two things that go wrong. One is that people in the lowest income households and in various groups that are marginalized and vulnerable in different ways, including people with disabilities, marginalized regional groups, marginalized ethno-linguistic groups, women are most likely not to be included in the data that governments use to determine where public spending goes and who gets it. At the same time, households at the top end of the income and wealth distributions are most likely, um, and Gabrielle Zuckman's work shows this repeatedly in all sorts of countries and contexts, people at the top end are most likely not to be declaring their incomes to the tax authority and therefore not to be captured in any schedule, progressive or otherwise, um, of taxation. And that gives us um, the following uh, picture. If the blue bars here are household groups by income, um, measured inequality between the top and bottom, if you like, is much, much smaller than the true inequality when we include the people at the bottom who are uncounted and the money at the top that is uncounted. That true inequality is much, much higher. Please do buy my book, which talks about this at great and painful length and why we need to fix it um, as part of fixing um, tax justice. Okay, the other two hours of tax um, often uh, overlooked. I need to get going a bit quicker. The third is repricing. Um, and 
this is a slightly contorted term in order to make it start with R, um, but I think reasonably intuitive. This is the idea that one of the things tax systems do is they change the relative price of public goods and public bads. So things like uh, the private consumption of tobacco, which inflicts large wider public health costs, should be higher than simply the cost of production would indicate. And an efficient tax system can make sure that that repricing happens and that tobacco is made effectively less attractive um, and, and also contributes back to some of the, the health costs that it imposes. More importantly, looking ahead and thinking about whether we will have a planet left, we really need to reprice the things that are burning the planet, particularly, but not only carbon emissions. And if we don't have effective tax systems, all around the world, not just in a handful of rich countries, then we will not be able to deliver the repricing that is almost certainly going to be part and only part, but part of um, preventing us um, setting fire to the, the thing that we are standing on as we travel through the universe. Last and absolutely not least, perhaps the most important, but certainly the most often overlooked element of tax that matters. The fourth R is representation. You've probably heard the American um, independence uh, rallying cry, no taxation without representation. We're not giving you the money if you don't give us a vote back in your, your imperial parliament there in London. Actually, the evidence pretty much shows it's the other way around in practice. There's no representation without taxation. And by that, I mean this, one of the very, very, very few things that is consistently found to be associated with strengthening governance, with reducing corruption, with better uh, political representation, is the share of tax revenues in government spending. So when governments are able consistently to rely on very high shares um, of revenue from natural resource wealth, or from foreign aid or from something else. If they're very small tax havens, perhaps from the kind of tax haven um, rents that you can generate, they don't rely on their people for tax to nearly the same degree. And because people get pissed off when they pay tax, they hold their governments to account. They say, where is my money? What are you doing with my money? Whereas if it's oil wealth, it's kind of dropping from the sky. And it turns out people just don't engage in the same way. They don't feel they have a right to hold governments to account. Now, here's a particular problem. It turns out that when you pay direct taxes, so you may know when, when your own, um, you know, your monthly wage bill, uh, wage um, statement arrives and you can see the amount of money that was taken off at source, um, perhaps if, if that's uh, your case, you're very aware of it in a completely different way from how you might be aware, for example, of the VAT that you pay um, when you go shopping. It's the awareness of that tax, the fact that it, it's more visible, it's more salient, it perhaps hurts more, it annoys you more, that makes you then hold government to account and wonder what they're doing with your money and think of it as your money that they're spending. So here's a problem. Going back to this graph, you know, Brazil in the mid 2000s, but could be lots of countries in lots of periods. The people at the right hand side of this graph in the highest income households are paying the lowest share of income in tax compared to everyone else. Right. So in some sense, these people should have less of a stake in how governments are spending their money. But because you'll recall underlying this are um, indirect and direct tax schedules that go in different directions. The people at the top end there are paying the highest share of their incomes in direct taxes, the ones that are most visible to them and to everyone else. The people at the left here who are paying almost half of their gross incomes in tax are only paying a couple of percent of it in direct taxes. And so a Brazilian study went and looked at people's sense of tax citizenship. Who feels like they have a right to hold government to account? Who feels like government is spending their money? Answer, the people at the right hand edge, the people with the highest incomes, with the lowest share going in tax, feel most empowered, most like they have the right to demand that government responds to their political references. Now think about it. In this particular case, um, but actually in many countries around the world, similar patterns will be true. 
we to the sense of representation. Male-headed households disproportionately to the right, the other way around. Then think about race. In Brazil, it's, you know, it's very clear, much more likely to be white at this end and black or indigenous at this end. And so, you know, and again, where are people, households with people with disabilities? Well, they're all at this end too. So the inequalities of political representation are exacerbated by the tax system. People and groups who for different reasons are already likely to be politically marginalized in one way or another, or socially vulnerable, socially marginalized or discriminated against, all of those people, many of whom will have intersecting and overlapping inequalities um, to face as well, are being made not only poorer, by this regressive tax system, but also less politically empowered. And the opposite is true for people at the other end. So our tax systems, when we get them wrong, are much worse than just not being good at giving money to people who need it more. We, and we, we shouldn't think of it in, in such narrow terms. This is politically poisonous. It's undermining um, our societies by deepening the very inequalities that we should and I think generally do want to be uh, reducing instead and we're not even very aware that this is happening but it's there and it's in so many of our tax systems. Um, I, I'm going to have to go a little bit quicker but I want to mention Professor Dorothy Brown's work on the whiteness of wealth which is a, a book that's just come out um, and uh, Professor Brown was in, interviewed by Naomi Fowler for the TaxCast which is our podcast talking about the way that the US tax code embeds racial inequalities and deepens them. Really um, fascinating. And, you know, it's in the US, but it's in lots of other countries, tax codes too, in different ways. Um, really worth um, getting, getting hold of if you care about tax and inequality, as I'm sure everyone does. Okay, one of the reasons why um, uh, governments around the world have not been very good at dealing with the problems that you see in that graph is what is called the tax consensus, the tax elements largely of the Washington consensus, which is kind of set policy in one way or another, certainly been a very powerful influence um, for the International Monetary Fund, the World Bank, other international organizations and national level uh, policy makers. And this is a really, really short version that doesn't do it justice, um, but uh, bear with me. The main points are these three. First of all, you do not put a lot of emphasis on direct taxes. They're said to be kind of distortionary or inefficient and, you know, economically, therefore, less desirable. Um, so you go after indirect taxes. You also replace trade taxes, which, you know, high income countries started getting rid of quite a long time ago and, and want lower income countries to get rid of, too. So you replace them with taxes on consumption. Um, and then you assume that the redistribution, if any, happens on the expenditure side. So we'll have regressive tax systems, but that's fine. They'll raise a bit of revenue and we'll spend the revenue progressively and it'll be okay. Now, of course, none of these things in practice um, have a solid evidence base or really hold very well. Um, you can take the emphasis off direct taxes. Those are not the distortions that are really affecting your economy. And actually something like corporate income tax is probably the most efficient tax that we've got. It only taxes companies when they make a profit and it only takes a piece of that and it doesn't affect the level of investment that is efficient. But still, you know, we have the World Bank doing in its doing business uh, indicators which rank countries and really drive policy, giving you higher marks every time you cut your corporate tax rate, regardless of how much you need the revenues or whatever the rate was to begin with. Really blinkered ideological nonsense, but still important in driving policy. Um, the IMF's own research shows that when you replace trade taxes with consumption taxes, lower income countries never get back the revenues they lost. And other people's research shows that one effect of this is that it's really seriously regressive. You're shifting taxation from international elites who are one way or another doing most of the international trade 
onto the masses who are doing most of the consumption, um, even uh, though they don't have uh, that much of the income. Um, and so the shift is, is a bad one. And of course, very often there just isn't enough revenue to do the kind of redistributive expenditure that you'd want to do, especially in lower income countries, especially if they are following the other tenets of the tax consensus. But the key thing really that is even worse than all of this is that it's based on an assumption that governments are there, government administration is effective, and the optimal tax policy is really just a decision about how much revenue and how much redistribution um, you want <clears throat> and maybe how much repricing. So this is the kind of stylized tax system. Government exists, makes a decision about taxation, and that gives you the, the three R's um, there. A stylized lower income country might look like this. Taxation itself gives rise not only to redistribution and revenue and repricing, but also over time to the quality of representation, to government itself. And so if tax systems are bad, we don't just have less money and more inequality and an inability to deal with things like tobacco or carbon. We also have bad government. Um, and you know, you can see this is not only a low income country problem, you know, the US um, political problems over the last couple of decades are not unrelated to the fact that parties of both sides have consistently undermined the IRS, the tax authority. Um, and only now is there an administration that is trying to do something about that. This is not in a vacuum from the problems of corruption, the weakening of governance that that country has experienced. This is not just a lower income country problem, but it's a problem that the tax consensus has worsened around the world. Okay, so national tax injustices are really a result of three things. Tax being largely neglected as a, as a development issue for many years, I would say really until about the mid 2000s when, um, uh, well, when I wrote the four R's for the first time, for example, but not that that was a tipping point, but you know, things really started um, to, to get moving a bit after that, a return to looking at tax. Then the tax consensus, this pressure for, for poor policy. And finally, the problem of illicit financial flows the profit shifting multinationals and the offshore um, use of uh, by individuals, undermining tax systems, undermining the ability of even a good government focused on these issues to have the kind of direct taxation that it wants because international cooperation is critical in order for that to work. And that takes us to the state of tax justice or rather tax injustice at the global level. $427 billion lost to global tax abuse every year. Another way of putting that, um, while we are in the context of a pandemic, every single second, uh, the equivalent of one nurse's annual salary is lost to a tax haven. The revenue losses are enormous. And at a time when we appear to be saying that the rich countries don't have enough money to pay for worldwide vaccination, never mind being willing to, to waive the patents on, on vaccines, um, that is obscene. And we should be very clear, this isn't um, a bad thing that it's a pity people aren't doing something about, rather this is a bad thing, which is a direct result of deliberate policy choices over decades and including today, particularly, but not only by the richest uh, countries in the world and the rest of us tolerating it. Okay, there's a set of tools that I want to point you to, but I'm not going to get into the detail of any of them. The Financial Secrecy Index brings together indicators on all of the different ways in which jurisdictions at, um, attract uh, illicit financial flows. Things like bank secrecy, like allowing anonymous company ownership, um, failing to cooperate internationally and to provide a degree of transparency. And you can find our rankings there. We publish that every, every two years. The Corporate Tax Haven Index we publish every other year in between, um, and that does a similar thing, but focused on the conditions for multinational uh, companies uh, looking at jurisdictions that try to attract profit shifting to the detriment of everyone else. They're not looking for the real activity of the multinationals, they just want the profit so that um, other people lose the tax revenues they should have and those profit uh, shifting jurisdictions get a tiny little piece um, that makes it worth their while and the multinationals and their big four accounting firm advisors um, do very nicely out of that so they're all in favour too. 
then the illicit financial flows vulnerability tracker breaks down using bilateral data on commodity trade, on direct investment, portfolio investment, and uh, banking in order to allow you to look from any one jurisdiction's point of view at where the biggest vulnerabilities are, where are the transactions with secrecy jurisdictions or corporate tax havens that I should be most worried about if I want to know where I'm at risk, where the threats come from. And the state of tax justice, as I say, is this report which puts together the tax losses, um, both corporate and individual tax losses suffered by jurisdictions and imposed on other jurisdictions. You can find all of that at um, iff.taxjustice.net country um, reports, which combine all of this information. They look something like this. Here's the Netherlands to use one of my favorite um, tax havens. And perhaps we should all use pictures of windmills and tulips to illustrate our media stories about tax havens rather than um, palm trees. Number four on the corporate tax haven index. Uh, number eight, apparently on the financial secrecy index. So pretty much bad across the board, imposing $36 billion of tax losses uh, on other countries eight and a half percent of the global tax losses from this one small um, European jurisdiction. Looking at a country that's uh, in effect on the other side, here's Guyana losing $288 uh, million a year um, to global tax abuse. That might not sound like a lot in the context of 427 billion, but for Guyana, that is a lot of money. It's more than a third of their tax revenues. Um, and so it's, apart from anything else, it's about three times their health budget the impact that it would have to reverse that would be enormous. And the cost, in a sense, on a place like the Netherlands, it wouldn't even be noticeable to unwind that amount of the tax loss they impose on others while being dramatically beneficial for Guyana. That, in a nutshell, is the state of global tax injustice. We allow very rich jurisdictions, by and large, OECD members, for the most part, to impose huge tax losses on others without holding them accountable. Um, and that is the challenge to drive forward accountability. A lot of the work we've done has really been about putting policies in place. First of all, the transparency to give us um, that accountability and then the policy changes to end those abuses. And that uh, in this final section is what I will um, talk fairly briefly about. Okay. The starting place, um, and I should say the Tax Justice Network was um, set up by uh, John Christensen um, in 2003. Now John had been the economic advisor to the, uh, the island of Jersey, which is a, a British crown dependency um, and one of the um, more well-known tax havens. Um, John wrote his resignation uh, letter in effect on the front page uh, of the Wall Street Journal by calling out the island for its role in international um, financial corruption. Um, and since then has been uh, working as uh, one of the one of the angels, um, if you like. Um, when John and colleagues put together the policy platform for the network in the first few years, 2003, 4, 5, it involved a whole set of things which people at the OECD, at the IMF, British and other international policymakers said, you know, even if we could kind of agree with where you want to go with this, this is unrealistic in the extreme. It's utopian. It's wild eyed. It will never, ever happen. And by and large, all of those things today make up the global policy agenda, but none of them have yet been fully delivered. And that's that's kind of where we are. So to begin with transparency, the stuff that kind of sounds easier and nicer and, you know, who's against transparency, right? We all like transparency, but actually uh, has been a huge fight. The ABC is kind of the, the core set of measures here. So A is the automatic exchange of financial information. This is in a sense, the measure which when fully delivered will end once and for all bank secrecy. This is um, the requirement for a multilateral instrument um, so signed by ideally eventually all countries and jurisdictions in the world, a commitment that each year they will tell every other country's tax authority about the financial accounts of their tax residents in this jurisdiction. So Switzerland will tell uh, Germany and the UK, but also India 
and Ghana and Guyana about the Indian and Guyanese and Ghanaian tax residents who have Swiss bank accounts, the value in those accounts and the interest earned within the year. That simple exchange of information in order for the Guyanan tax authority to match it up with what the Guyanan tax resident has declared at home is enormously powerful. As long as you can have your offshore accounts without any sense that anyone will ever tell your tax authority, um, we know, and the evidence is very clear, the level of international tax evasion is absolutely rife. And it's concentrated not just in the top 1%, but the top 0.01% of households. These are the people who do not meet their responsibilities and do it very deliberately. Automatic information exchange is an important tool to end that. The, the IRS, the US Tax Authority, they find that where they have a third party source of information, the level of compliance is seven times higher. Now that's the most powerful tax authority in the world, probably even now after years of being deliberately weakened. And yet, if there isn't somebody else providing the information, whether it's your employer or Swiss banks or whoever, people overwhelmingly uh, comply much less with their responsibilities. When they know the information is coming from somewhere else anyway, they tell the truth, they make the declaration, they pay the tax. Really powerful piece of transparency. Secondly, beneficial ownership transparency. This is about public registers of the beneficial ownership, who is the warm blooded human being, not just the next company or whatever, the warm blooded human being at the end of the chain, who is the ultimate beneficial owner of this company, this trust, this foundation. Tying that together seals off the other key way in which people use legal vehicles along with bank accounts to hide the ownership of assets uh, and income streams. Not just important for shutting down tax abuse, but all sorts of uh, corruption and criminality, the laundering, the proceeds of crime and so on. Um, key measures, if we can't look through legal vehicles to the ultimate owners, everything can be hidden and nobody behaves better um, when they are uh, hidden. Finally, country by country reporting, which is a measure for multinational companies, basically putting them on a level playing field with standalone domestic businesses that have to publish their company accounts each year. Multinationals publish their global consolidated accounts and that really hides an enormous amount of information. If you need to kind of think about where the profit shifting is happening, you need to know where the activity is taking place. So for each country, what proportion of the multinational group sales are taking place there? What proportion of their employment is there? How many of their people? And then what uh, profits are they declaring? What tax are they paying? So you can see if you know Google has 10% of its sales and 10% of its employment in the UK, but only declares 1% of its profits, and the picture is the exact opposite in Ireland, say, or the Netherlands, you know, as the UK tax authority, you've got a problem and you know where to start looking to. What are the transactions with this other place that the UK entities of, of the Google or Alphabet multinational are carrying out? It's a thread that you pull because you can see the scale of profit shifting in broad terms with this information um, in the public domain. We haven't got it in the public domain yet, and I should say none of these are yet fully delivered. We have automatic exchange, a multilateral instrument for more than 100 um, countries and jurisdictions. Most lower income countries, though, are still not included. Um, and the United States still does not participate. It's the one big holdout. Demands information from everyone, provides information to almost no one. Beneficial ownership. This is being established as an international standard now. Increasingly, we see it for companies across the European Union. It's also coming in for trusts and foundations, but it's a key place where um, havens are holding out. And we really need to see that as a requirement. It shouldn't be possible to create anonymous, um, anonymously owned entities anymore. Country by country reporting, we have an OECD standard based on the original tax justice network um, accounting standard, but the information is not yet public. We get some aggregate data only, we don't get the company level information. But as we speak, the European Parliament and the European Commission and the European Council, that's the member states, are negotiating how they will make this information public. And if you do it for all the multinationals that are operating in the EU, 
that pretty much will cover the vast majority of multinationals that are big enough to be reporting on this standard. So we are getting there, but we need that information. We need it not just for the rich country tax authorities that currently have it, we need it for everyone. So the public can hold multinationals accountable. So lower income country tax authorities get this data too, and can also fight the, uh, the profit shifting that they find. On corporate tax, that data will also underpin a great shift that you know we've long been calling for. Getting away from arm's length pricing, which is this idea that you can somehow set prices for transactions within the multinational and the profits will end up in the right entity and then we'll just tax them as if they were a standalone firm and instead saying, no, that's economically illogical. It's not how multinationals work. And if they did, it wouldn't be worth their while being multinationals, they'd be standalone companies. Instead, they maximize profit at the top, at the global level. What we need to do is say that ta that profit should be taxed in each of the countries where they make their money and will allocate the profit for tax purposes according to the proportion of economic activity in each country. So if 10% of Google's activity is in the UK, then 10% of the global profits should be for the UK to apply its tax rate to and so on. This would be much fairer and much less uh, easy to gain. The other piece of that would be to add in a global minimum corporate tax rate. And I'm going to come to where we are in, in progress on these uh, in, in uh, a couple of minutes before I completely run out of time. Um, but this is the idea that, you know, one thing is to make profit shifting much harder by insisting that profits go to the places where the activity takes place. That goes a long way. The other piece is to say, let's also make profit shifting much less attractive by imposing this global minimum rate. So even if you somehow manage to get your profits into a place that has a low or zero tax rate, the places that those profits really came from have the right to top up the tax to 21%, 25%, 30%, whatever it may be, so that there's nothing to be gained from doing this anyway, even if you can still find ways to gain the system and get your profits um, out from the place that they really uh, arise in. Two big things which are, which are slowly, slowly moving our way. Finally, the reason that none of these things have been fully delivered is that the global architecture is bust. We have all this stuff happening at the OECD, the group of rich countries who are themselves responsible for more than two thirds of the global problems of tax abuse um, and add in their dependent territories. And actually, it's a bigger share even than that. We need this stuff out of the opaque um, and biased uh, processes of the OECD and into the open, relatively democratic and certainly much more transparent and inclusive processes of the United Nations. And that starts with a UN tax convention to be negotiated, to set the terms for an intergovernmental body, to set minimum standards for the ABC of transparency, and to create a centre for monitoring taxing rights, an idea floated uh, first in my book, The Uncounted, did I mention by my book, um, which basically would bring together the global data on this and make sure that annually we have an accounting like the state of tax justice, but done officially of which countries are imposing what costs on others and what losses are being suffered where. So we can track progress um, all the way through. All right, two big opportunities, and then I will uh, finish up and, and uh, ask for, for questions. The first is the UN FACTI panel. It's a high level panel that's put out its report this year. And alongside that, the Secretary General's process on illicit financial flows. This is really moving fast. The UN finally is kind of stepping up and it's great to see what they're putting on the table is the global tax justice agenda. And what it needs now is for member states to step up. The G77 group of um, lower income countries has been calling for much of this for years, long before the FACTI panel or indeed before we, the Tax Justice Network did. They are in a sense, the owners of this agenda, but we need at least some of the rich countries in the OECD to get with the program to, to recognize that the OECD isn't even delivering for its own members and to see that it would simply be better and more just both to do this at the United Nations. So the, the FACTI panel gave us kind of four big wins. First of all, it affirmed the scale of the problem. It really confirmed all the evidence that we others have put together and said, yeah, this is, this is what illicit financial flows and global tax abuse look like. And then it confirmed these three elements of the policy platform. The ABC really calling for, for everything that we've, that we've called for here, um, give or take. 
um, the corporate tax vision, both pieces, unitary taxation and a global minimum corporate tax. And then these global architectural reforms, a UN convention giving rise to an intergovernmental body and a sense of monitoring, monitoring taxing rights um, fully delivered. This would be the very greater part of the global tax justice uh, agenda. And we now need individual uh, member states to make their positions clear um, and, and come out in support. The other piece is what's still happening at the OECD, and this is where the Biden intervention has been significant. The process of, of BEPS, base erosion and profit shifting um, initiative began in 2012-2013 uh, and really has failed to deliver. We're now into BEPS 2.0, which was kicked off at the end of 2018 um, to try and fix what they hadn't fixed the first time round. And this time it, it pledged to go further, to go beyond arm's length pricing, um, at least to some extent to look at unitary taxation. But in practice, what they've been negotiating is a very, very tiny element only of global profits would be taxed on that basis. It's very, very far from the ambition that's needed. And then under, that's pillar one, under pillar two, a commitment to a global minimum corporate tax, hooray, but at such a low level, 12.5% is what the OECD have talked about, that it would have very little impact. And with a set of very complex rules that would pr privilege the headquarters countries, and that's the OECD member countries by and large, over the host countries, which includes most uh, lower income countries. So a low rate, lacking ambition, but also the benefits being captured by OECD members and very little shared with others, despite the fact that those other countries accounting for about half the world's population um, also suffer the most intense tax losses still to be cutting them out and we have um, uh, a new set of evidence on this tomorrow I can't break our embargo but I can tell you that the size of the numbers what could be delivered with a, a global minimum tax at the 21% rate that Biden has proposed but done on the basis that we're suggesting that would ensure benefits for lower income countries too would be truly uh, dramatic there is about three months before that agreement needs to be delivered uh, in July and we could really see progress there but at the minute the OECD proposals would cut most of the benefits away from lower income countries so this is a moment to be calling on governments and saying that's unconscionable you OECD countries have the power you have to deliver not just for you for everyone and there's no trade-off here you're not giving anything up in going for a better process of the proposal of the sort that we put forward you're just making sure that there are also benefits for others um, why wouldn't you do this this is genuinely a win-win simply by reducing the extent to which multinationals keep their profits untaxed okay did i mention please buy my book um, but apart from the uncounted there is this book uh, with professor peter jansky um, which is open access so it's free you don't even need to buy it um, downloadable from the oxford university press website this is in a sense the the very uh, much more academic version of what i've presented today a review a great critical review of all of the estimates of tax losses to multinational profit shifting and to individual uh, offshore evasion and a look at some other illicit financial flows and a set of detailed policy proposals including for indicators which are now being piloted by the UN as indicators for the sustainable development goals target that deals with illicit financial flows all of that free who says you get nothing for free let me finish there finally um, and um, uh, invite your questions but thank you for uh, for staying with the ramble at least to this point thanks so much Alex that was really interesting and I hope you don't mind but if we stick around for about 15 minutes that would be great but th and thanks for all of you for coming if you do um feel like you have to leave or you've got something else on no worries i appreciate it i know with the pubs and stuff opening up that you might have somewhere to be and that uh, well, to us uni students anyway sitting outside has translated into starting early so i really appreciate you all coming um but let's crack on with some of these questions they're flying in now um so Hugo is asking, he's, he's reread Capital by Thomas Pic Piketty, and he proposes the introduction of a global tax to regulate inherent wealth accumulation mechanisms of capitalism. 
putting feasibility aside and taking the political implications into account, would you advocate for having a global or international taxation, for example, a fiscal union in the EU? That's a great question. Um, look, what Piketty really is uh, talking about, and I think this is interesting, he says, in a sense, he draws a parallel with um, the introduction of land registries uh, in France during the French Revolution. And this is at a time when effectively all wealth is land. So a land registry is really a register of wealth, who owns what. And so for the first time in the revolution, they created a, a cadaster, a, a register of land ownership. So people knew what the level of wealth inequality was and you know who owned what, how it looked. And so it provided the basis for wealth taxation, for land taxation. And that's one of very few things that was a long-term legacy of the revolution. Even when everything else changed politically, they kept the register because it empowers governments and it allows you to say, politically, um, we want to think about inequality and practically this is the way, um, or at least a way that we can do it. So Piketty is really talking about a global uh, tax on wealth as a way of generating the demand for a global register of assets. And, you know, we've done work with, with Piketty, who's one of the commissioners on the Independent Commission for the Reform of International Corporate Taxation, which is one of the big supporters of a global um, asset register. It was a very interesting pilot by my colleague, Andres Knobel, looking at the UK case and thinking about how you could join up the existing registers in order to get to something like a register of all the UK wealth, and then how that might talk to others in other countries to start building towards this. Piketty's argument that a global tax, even a very, very, very tiny one on, on wealth, would be fundamentally important because it would motivate the collection of that information, the creation of that register. And for the first time, we would understand what global wealth distribution and inequality really looks like. It's a really compelling one. And, you know, we certainly support that. I suspect there isn't a great desire politically, even now with wealth taxes being being discussed and adopted in the context of the pandemic, to get to the global level. But what I think we'll see is national wealth taxation becoming more and more common and more and more significant in revenue terms. And over a period, that's going to normalise the idea that actually some of this you might want to join up and say, look, let's, let's be generating some of this more efficiently globally and just apportioning it back to where the wealth owners uh, reside for tax purposes. Because actually in order to understand wealth, we have to act globally. And so we may as well tax on that basis too. I think it's a way down the road, but it's definitely kind of in the tax justice uh, thinking right now. Oh, thanks. Um, moving on, we've got a bit of a cheeky question from an anonymous attendee. He said, if um, fixing the system would really be a win-win situation, why has it not happened yet? Which, yeah, it's quite, it's an interesting one because it goes on to those political motivations because actually culturally, some people like the rich. They like the idea of people getting rich, you know, and enjoying their wealth. I mean, I, I don't, want to, don't want to come over all Peter Mendelssohn, but I'm quite relaxed about people being rich. What I care yeah. about and what the Tax Justice Network cares about is people meeting their responsibilities. So why hasn't this happened? Well, you know, it's the same reason that the Tax Justice Network was set up, right? There's a group of people sitting in rooms around the world, what, what would be Zoom calls these days, but feeling like as international and national tax discussions were held at a high technical level, they were the only person in the room who cared about social justice questions. And actually, as the network got going, it turned out there were quite a lot of those people, people sitting in discussions about the tax rules for multinationals, about terribly esoteric points about, you know, how you tax a particular type of royalty under a particular treaty in a particular context but for whom they had in the back of their mind this idea. They didn't have the numbers and they couldn't see to the extent that we can now the scale of this problem, but they had a sense that it was unfair and that decisions were being taken that didn't reflect the concerns of people who were not just outside the room, but 
held very far away from those discussions by the kind of the technical gatekeeping that stopped you coming in the room if you didn't work for a big four accounting firm or one of the major law firms or a major multinational or one of the big countries um, treasury departments where very often there'd be a revolving door with those private sector employees. You had to be kind of in the club to be in the policy discussion and nobody in the club or very few people in the club actually had this sense of the national and global inequalities that um, should have been driving those decisions. So I'd say we're much closer now than we've ever been. And even the OECD, right? And there are lots of very good people in the OECD. I don't want to, to vilify um, the secretariat but they work for member states who are subject to these political processes and people with power and companies with enormous amounts of um, profit globally have very very systematically um, built their power bases within the system the number just to give one example the number of uh, employees of the major swiss banks who have gone on to work for the u.s treasury is extraordinary when you wouldn't otherwise expect there to be any relationship between those two things, right? This isn't random. And similarly, the role of the big four accounting firms in government uh, decision-making processes on tax and lots of other things is very deliberately created and built up. So that there is a lot of reason why people in the rooms are not looking for the win-wins. They're looking to protect the status quo. They're looking not to scare the horses. They're looking to keep things more or less as they are because we're all happy with that, aren't we chaps? Right? We've been standing outside kicking the door for a good couple of decades now. It's getting easier to get in the room and there are more people in the room who care about this stuff. And there are more people who care, who are willing and able to raise their voices. So we're on the road, but the forces arrayed against tax justice are enormously powerful nationally and internationally. And we shouldn't kid ourselves that the next thing that's gonna happen is gonna be anything other than a really really big pushback. It's already happening around the Biden administration, um, but it's going to be coming in all sorts of other places too. But we have to keep fighting. This is this is the job, right? Cool, thanks. It sounds like there's a bunch of oligarchs trying to solve climate change. Almost. <laughs> um, moving on to Martin's question, he's interested in financial transaction tax. So a tiny tax rate on the value of financial transactions not only those as a sale of shares or derivatives, but money transfers as well. So we are broadly supportive of this. Um, and one of our senior advisors, Jim Henry, is, is doing some really important work in the, the New York um, process uh, at the minute, which, which may really fix the financial transactions tax um, that New York has, what well, has kind of had in place, but has effectively not used for, for decades. And that could set a very valuable precedent for others. Financial transactions taxes aren't, aren't kind of the solution to global development problems that I think sometimes people have thought they might be. They'll raise money where the big financial markets are. That reduces some of the bad behavior in those markets. It's sand in the wheels and that's very important as a, as a regulatory measure. And it makes sure that we have better information about ownership, which is important to understand these wider processes and inequalities. But it really raises money in places where there is already money. You know, the UK doesn't have any problem raising revenue if it wants to. So a financial transactions tax won't suddenly kind of free things up and make them decide to spend more on aid or whatever else we'd like them to, to spend money on in a, in a better world. It's really perhaps making it politically a bit easier. So these are valuable measures, but they're in a sense, not the scale and not the political uh, importance of some of the broader tax justice measures. Cool, thanks. Um, moving on to Zach's question, how difficult is it when modeling the impacts of different tax schedules to account for trickle down effects that are proposed by some classical economists? How do you gather proxies for the theorized wider economic impact of less progressive tax schedules and how trustworthy are they? So in a sense, you have to you have to trace those things over time. Um, and one of the things with trickle down economics has always been that, you know, it's such a punt that it's actually quite difficult to construct the kind of length of time series to say, no, this is crap. This doesn't happen at all. This is not, you know, by giving a tax break to people at the very top who already 
consume much less of their income because it's impossible for them to consume the same proportion that their income people do. The idea that this will somehow stimulate the economy. We know exactly the reverse much more easily where Brazil, for example, under Lula introduced um, uh, uh, income uh, transfers to poorer households the impact was absolutely dramatic, especially at the kind of macro level. Um, some of the poorest regions that received a bigger share of their state income in these income transfers going to the poorest households saw massive increases in economic activity. There was a trickle up that was really powerful um, because that's where you get the biggest stimulus effect in a kind of Keynesian uh, type way. So, you know, but on the trickle down side, we do now actually have some quite good evidence. There's a lovely paper from the LSE from I think just the end of last year, which looks at 50 years of um, tax cuts for major corporations and for people at the top end of uh, the income distribution. And it finds absolutely zero impact on economic growth, right? If economic growth was the only thing that we care about, which it really, really shouldn't be, but even if it was, the evidence is now in, trickle down doesn't do it. And so we should start thinking about the stuff that we care about. We should listen even to the IMF saying inequality is one of the biggest obstacles to growth. So even if we only cared about growth, we should start by addressing inequality. And that means trickle down can trickle off and we'll start by um, you know, making sure that people at lower incomes and marginalised groups are much better supported because it'll actually be better for all of us, even economically, never mind in terms of um, our societies and, and politics. This is, you know, the evidence is in, this is a no-brainer. The only reason we wouldn't do this is because we are bad people or we allow our policies to be set by bad people. And that's the choice that we have. Cool, thanks. Um, Beckett is asking about the impact on crypto of cryptocurrencies on tax evasion, in your opinion. So this is a, a definite concern. Um, something that's been growing for a while, and we've seen places like Cyprus kind of aggressively positioning themselves to have worse, um, or, or as they would say, more streamlined regulation of cryptocurrencies. Um, Gibraltar and others have also kind of tried to to get in this game. Um, uh, it's, you know, it creates another way of having anonymous ownership. It's also extraordinarily um, uh, bad for the planet, um, just the, the amount of energy used in, in creating these things. So it seems pretty clear that we should be regulating very much harder than we are. There are cases for people to be able to use money without, in a sense, feeling the, the eyes of the state on them, but not for anonymous ownership of the sort that drives tax abuse uh, and corrupt practices of all sorts. And cryptocurrency is definitely a risk uh, in, in that sense. Cool. Brilliant. Um, we'll have one, one last question for you. Do intergovernmental organisations have the power to initiate these reforms? Can't countries simply ignore UN recommendations and initiatives? I would think one country or a few being a tax haven would be enough to undermine all efforts in reforming the system. So this is, uh, thank you, anonymous uh, attendee. Um, yeah. there's, a, there's something in that, that the OECD reforms as they're currently structured Pillar one, um, the one about kind of going beyond arm's length pricing was set up in such a way that you would need, you know, designed very badly, that you would need global treaty change. And that would have allowed the Netherlands or Ireland or any haven to, to, to block it effectively um, and sort of to refuse to allow the cooperation that would be needed for things to come into effect. But pillar two, the global minimum tax, can operate as a coalition of the willing. If the US and major EU states and other big countries in the G20, and then I think lots of other lower income countries would follow too, uh, were, were to go ahead on you know something like a 21% basis, in effect, it wouldn't work for Ireland or anyone else to, well, first of all, there wouldn't be anything they could block. This would be being done in, in national legislation. But then secondly, there'd be no benefit to Ireland of maintaining either the 12.5% headline rate or the near zero effective rates that it often gives away because 
the profit that got those rates wherever it had come from would end up being topped up the tax being topped up until it got to 21 percent the revenues would just go to somebody other than ireland they'd go to you know france where the activity really took place or us where the the headquarters of the multinational were it would happen anyway and so the incentive to divert profits through ireland for some small benefit to the irish economy would simply disappear so a lot of havens right now especially after you know the um, Biden and Janet Yellen coming out so strongly on this um, last week. A lot of havens are looking at their business model and they're thinking, shit, this just isn't going to work. It's not, it's not, this isn't one of those OECD things where we make a little change and, you know, we say we'll stop doing that and we introduce this, which basically does the same thing under a different name or we do this slightly more secretly. No, it's just not going to work anymore. So those countries and jurisdictions that are really heavily dependent on profit shifting in particular, the days are numbered for that business model. Now, for the ones which are small dependent territories, particularly of the UK, the UK owes a massive responsibility to them to fund the development of alternative economic paths forward. The UK was comfortable for far too long saying, you go down this road, you become tax havens, funnel some money into the city of London, we'll be all right, you'll be all right, and we won't have to pay aid to, to keep your people um, out of poverty. That is on the UK, the responsibility is on the UK. It's one of the last and nastiest uh, legacies of empire. That's being unwound now. So you could focus on the non-corporate dirty bit, or you could really say, we need to look a different way. And Ireland and the Netherlands and Luxembourg and all the others that have more power and money, but also have their own problems of inequalities, because being a tax haven also makes you more unequal. It's bad for you too. They're going to have to find ways to unpick this themselves. But that's what needs to be happening. There isn't an option to block this effectively anymore. And what's coming down the road, including at the UN, is going to involve international coordination with either effects of this sort that work even if tax havens try to stand in the way or powerful countermeasures that will make it simply too painful to try to stand in the way. It would be much better for any of those places to be seeing it coming now. You know, you've resisted for decades, but it isn't going to hold anymore. For your good, for the good of your people who probably aren't benefiting much from your tax havenry anyway, get out ahead of this while you've still got the chance and find that alternative and for the UK to look to its territories and say we are responsible for having pushed you down this road and we recognize it and we recognize it's going to take a lot of our resources to help you get off it but we owe it to you think of it as a form of reparations if you like the UK in particular really needs to step up on this brilliant well I think we're going to wrap it up there but thanks a lot Kind of ended on a bit of a positive note, which is good. But the tide's changing maybe a little bit, hopefully. It's all, it's all positive. We're just, <laughs> just getting there. Yeah. Look, thanks very much. Um, please, uh, my e email if people want to um, pick any other questions, and I'm sorry for being long-winded and, and not getting to them all. Um, I'm alex at taxjustice.net or at Alex Cobham on Twitter. And, you know, we're always happy to, to hear from people and, you know, support you taking these ideas uh, forward for, for tax justice. Well, thanks so much, Alex, and for all of you for coming. And hopefully see you soon at the next final uh, lecture of the series, which is um, the Green New Deal with Michael Jacobs. So 